Madam Mayor, good morning, everyone. Superintendent. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, Madam Mayor, uh, Council. Before I get started, I'd just like to introduce the members that I have with me here uh, today. Uh, Della Rankin is one of our crime uh, analysts, and I have uh, Constable Rich McCarty, who's one of our crime prevention officers, and you'll be hearing from them uh, very shortly. So this morning, what we'd like to do is spend the next 15 to 20 minutes uh, talking about giving you a snapshot of one district and really what resources in one district uh, you have available to you here in East Gwillimbury. We'll talk a little bit about our frontline uh, workload for our officers. Uh, we'll also discuss such uh, crime trends and traffic enforcement trends in the community. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we deploy our resources and how we make those decisions and what our response is to certain, uh, certain issues in the community and uh, information that we're receiving. So one district uh, is located in New Market on uh, 240 Prospect Street. Uh, the, the command staff there is myself and Inspector Jackie Wilson, who is new to uh, the command staff there. We have 144 officers at that location, uh, or uniform officers, and they're broken down into four different platoons. And those platoons work 12-hour uh, shifts, two-day shifts, and four night shifts, so four on and four off. Uh, also, our CIB office is there, uh, which is broken into two different categories, person crimes and property crimes. So our person crimes officers investigate uh, crimes against persons, such as assault, domestic violence. Our property crime members investigate uh, such things as break and enters, street level robberies, as well as they do a lot of our drug enforcement and proactive drug enforcement initiatives. We also have our core unit. Uh, currently, it's not out of our district, but they report to me, and they're located on Bales Drive in, uh, in East Gwillimbury. Uh, those nine officers are an essential tool for, uh, for the command staff. We can deploy them uh, as we see uh, fit for the priorities of the community, such as some of our complaint areas, some of our traffic enforcement initiatives. These are also the officers that uh, run our, uh, our, a lot of our community events. So things like your recent Santa Claus parade, these are the officers that are assigned that. They do the plans together, the planning for that to make sure that they run uh, safely. There's also seven civilian staff, which would include uh, our analyst, Della Rankin. Uh, so that's about 198 officers that work out of that, uh, that uh, our district. And every day or every one of those 12-hour shifts, we deploy a minimum of 18 officers into 16 different sectors and two directed patrol or traffic management cars. That's our minimum staffing that we have to deploy each and every day. Uh, for the evening shifts or the afternoon shifts, we've now implemented a new shift, which is 12 to 12 and 3 to 3. So, so you can imagine in years past, we would have had the same number of officers working at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the call volume was really high as we would have at 3 a.m. where the call volume is now very low. So by implementing a 12 to 12 and a 3 to 3 shift, we're now covering off where we see the primary uh, demands for service are. So one district is unique for all of the districts in, uh, in the region uh, in that we have four municipalities that I'm responsible to. Uh, there's the Township of King, uh, the Town of Aurora, Newmarket, and of course East Gwillimbury. And that's the breakdown for our sector cars. We have three sector cars in King, three in Aurora, eight in Newmarket, and two in East Gwillimbury. So as you know, York Region is one of the fastest growing uh, populations in Canada. It's also one of the most diverse uh, populations in Canada. And in my almost 30 years, that's always been an extreme uh, challenge for us, just to keep up with that growth and diversity alone. So some of the things that we've done over the last years is the call prioritization review. Uh, of course, that has led uh, also to our sector policing model. And our sector policing model was a real look at how we can balance workload for our officers to give them an opportunity to do proactive policing as well as community engagement and not be specific uh, to just doing calls for service. And that's what we've implemented in one district in the last year. We'll be coming up on the year anniversary in February. We'll, we'll be doing a review of that to see where we fit with our prioritization. We're also using business intelligence. And we are one of the leading organizations, police organizations in the country in how we're now implementing business intelligence tools and our intelligence dashboards and getting to the point where we're now into predictive policing, which is a real step forward in our profession. And York Regional Police is leading the way in that regard. 
Uh, you'll see a new uh, station uh, that's coming to uh, Newmarket uh, that will give us the opportunity to expand, as you know, uh, to have more resources in place, and that'll be uh, completion hopefully in 2020. We also have one of the most modern police training facilities in uh, all of Canada, which is located in East Gwillimbury, just off of uh, Bales Drive as well, uh, that is vastly needed to keep up with training our new recruiting, our new recruits. Uh, recruiting is, again, one of our priorities. Uh, if you look back 30 years ago, uh, when guys like myself were hired, uh, you would have had a, a real expansion of York Regional Police at that time. And of course, a lot of those officers are now looking to retirement. So we are now facing the challenge of recruiting uh, new officers to replace uh, the officers that are now uh, heading to sunny Florida. Uh, mental health support is an example of some of our community and, and community partnerships and looking more for more community partnerships where we can share our resources, such as working with the school and Barry bylaw officers as well. And mental health support we now have at our district, we have in-house in our district uh, civilian mental health support workers uh, that deploy with our officers to deal with the major challenges of mental health and, uh, and supporting our community in that way. And of course, community engagement is a, is a priority for York Regional Police. Uh, we see that the more we can engage the community, the more we can build that trust and confidence in the community, uh, the more uh, confidence there is, the more likely people are looking to uh, assist us and, uh, and report uh, crimes and report uh, information that they're seeing. So I'll talk about evidence-based decisions. So for a district commander, it's very important to me to base my decisions on how we deploy our resources in an evidence-based way. And how do we do that? Um, one in way is we look at information that comes in from the community. So it's our community members that uh, live on a certain street, uh, that drive to work down certain streets, that are the ones that are bringing to our attention uh, traffic management concerns. And we then assign those uh, concerns a complaint area, and those complaints are then often assigned to our core units, as well as they're uh, given to our officers that work in those sectors. And we go out and we uh, attack those complaints that, uh, that we're given. And we do at least a minimum of eight actions on those complaint areas before we determine what's the next step. So it's an opportunity for our officers to go there, monitor traffic, and determine if the complaint is valid, and if so, what the next steps in an initiative would be in order to uh, tackle that complaint. Also, information comes from our officers. Our officers are on the streets 24 hours a day. Uh, we leave our officers in those sectors uh, for a minimum of six months so they get to know the community very well before they might move to another sector. And sometimes those officers will stay in those sectors far longer than that. And they understand where the, the uh, high collision intersections are. They understand where some of the other uh, continued traffic issues may be. Of course, business intelligence, which we just spoke about. And one of the key resources that I use is our crime analysis and our, our, our analysts who will be up in a moment to speak as well to look at and predict where uh, we're seeing problems for the future. Here's an example of our business intelligence tool. So this is a dashboard that sits, I have on my computer every morning, and I can surf through this uh, uh, software and see where we're, where we're responding and how we're responding. So I'll just draw your attention to the uh, pie chart in the center. So our goal is to have our officers spend 30% of their time on calls or generated calls for service, 30% of their time on administrative work, 30% of their time on proactive policing, and 10% of their time on community engagement. So when the sectors were set up, that's what our goal was. And you'll see we're close in some regards in those numbers, and that's the one district pie chart. So if I look to sector 14, which is East Gwillimbury, you'll see the numbers are very similar to the rest of our district. So 43% of our time, our officers are spending on citizens generated calls for service, and 34% of their time is spent doing proactive policing, such as uh, traffic management at an intersection or patrolling an area where maybe we've had break-ins to vehicles in the evening or uh, anything that might have been identified by a crime analyst. 
So I'm able to, from this, uh, also click on each one of those boxes and see what that breaks down to be. So if I look at citizens generated calls in, in uh, East Willenberry, that's your breakdown. And we prioritize our calls from one to four. One being an emergency where it's uh, ongoing and where there's a risk to public safety. Two is where it's in progress, uh, but there's no risk to public safety. And three are, are generally our routine calls that we would uh, attend, something that has occurred in the past that might be reported from the night before. So if I go to the priority one calls, that's our breakdown. And if you look along the bottom of that chart, that's the hours spent year to date. And you'll see the number one priority one call for us is a weapons call. And that might be a call where someone uh, has a firearm, uh, a knife, or some sort of offensive weapon. And you can see we would spend close to 160 hours thus far in East Gwillimbury on investigating those types of calls. And of course, the number two for East Gwillimbury would be domestic, uh, domestic violence. So it's an ongoing domestic violence call would be their number two call. So for our priority two calls, and might surprise some of you, so almost 350 hours we've spent for emotionally disturbed or mental health issues, right? That is our number one uh, call that we respond to is assisting people with mental health issues. Of course, the number two is impaired driving, and those could be us responding to a call for a citizen, a citizen calling in that they're following an impaired driver, or one of our officers themselves has pulled someone over in a traffic stop, potentially for speeding, and of course may end up arresting that individual for impaired driving. That's our number two uh, calls for service. And then if you go down to our priority three calls, the next one is investigating motor vehicle collisions, property damage, and the number two for that is theft. And of course, Della will get into more details in that as well. So I'll now turn the mic over to Della, who will talk about crime analysis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, so my role as the, as the crime analyst at One District is to uh, review occurrence reports. Sure. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so my role is to review officers' reports and calls for service. And uh, in doing so, that helps me to identify areas or locations of interest or concern uh, to the community, as well as identifying any crime trends or series or emerging crime trends and series uh, that may be um, an ongoing issue or developing. So each week after reading the reports, which I do daily, each week I prepare a uh, detailed report that will highlight locations of interest or concern to the community and that officers should be aware of and uh, would require additional patrol or a police presence, and that's with respect to traffic issues, uh, community safety, or criminal activity. Uh, for officer awareness, I'm also going to provide information on uh, persons of interest that are known for engaging in criminal activity that might be uh, in, active in a specific area. Uh, now, when there are um, incidents of concern or there are, is a crime trend that I've identified, again, by monitoring reports, I'm looking for certain characteristics or patterns in those activities or incidents, and that's going to assist me into uh, key areas. It's identifying potential suspects or persons of interest that may be responsible for the activity um, or what's causing it. And then it's also going to help me to identify when, is, when it's most problematic and where, in terms of geography, where are, is this activity, where, is, where are these series taking place, uh, is there a specific day that they're occurring, and is there a time range in which they're most likely to occur. And then what that helps me to do is conduct or put together a predictive analysis piece. I can then direct frontline officers to um, uh, attend a specific area or a location in res with respect to the series, and it's directed patrol, so it's a better use of their resources. I can tell them when they need to be in an area, what area they need to be in, what time of day, and I can even narrow it down sometimes to a specific day. So again, it's just lending to a more effective use of the resources. Uh, this information, it's something that I provide to my command staff. It's a flow of information. We, it's uh, constant feedback uh, through command, through our core offices, through the CIB, and um, through our crime prevention officer. 
I also prepare bulletins. Uh, if there is something that's come up, I could get a quick email uh, from an outside agency or maybe an officer on the road has found something. And I think that that's something that the district as a whole needs to be aware of. I can send out a quick bulletin or even something like a, a short email message just saying you need to be aware of this, this is what's happening, so that when officers are actually still out there on patrol, they can check something out fairly quickly. So um, I've been the analyst at one district now for six years. Uh, I think that's the longest that an analyst has hung around at a district. Uh, I live in one district, and um, I, uh, I'm very familiar with a lot of the issues, a lot of the crime trends and, and things that are happening around here. Again, I, I walk my dog regularly. I know where all the graffiti is and things like that. So I watch that kind of stuff. It's, it's important to me as well. And what I can tell you, though, from my perspective and from my work and what I'm looking at regularly is that, that East Gwillimbury is one of the safest communities uh, compared to some of the other areas that we serve in one district. Uh, I don't see the crime trends or series uh, occurring in East Gwillimbury that I see in other areas that are occurring there. Um, I do not come across any reports um, that indicate that there is an organized crime presence in your community, that there is in other areas. Uh, I'm not seeing the violent offenses that affect quality of life or um, serious property crimes. There might be a blip or a spike in, say, uh, vehicle entries, but it doesn't sustain itself for a long period of time here. Again, it's, it's one of the safest communities that I look at. And um, if what I did was I backed that up when I, when I look at you know, why, how things work in terms of trending, I do a calls for service analysis. So for the purposes of this, I did a five-year calls for service analysis. And um, I, uh, my superintendent spoke to it just earlier. The top five calls that officers respond to in East Gwillimbury are emotionally disturbed persons, impaired, driving hazards, uh, silent 911s, and check welfares. So um, those serious or violent crimes are very low in terms of uh, the numbers. And what's really important for a takeaway for you is that they're actually trending downwards, uh, particularly in your community. Uh, so whatever you're doing here, keep doing it. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Stella. And uh, Rich uh, McCarty, our crime prevention officer. Super able to just forward that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I'm, I'm Richard McCarty. I'm a, a crime prevention officer. Uh, I work out of the one district station. I am assigned uh, uh, out of the Community Services Bureau. So we have a crime prevention unit. There's five officers that are involved in that unit. And uh, each officer is, uh, is deployed at uh, their respective districts throughout the region. Um, some of the uh, some of the, the programs that I'm involved in, and, and uh, the one district area again, as the superintendent mentioned, is King, King Township, Aurora, Newmarket, and East Williamberry. So I kind of have to oversee and, and get to a whole lot of areas in within the one district area. Um, but uh, some of the programs that we do address and, and we look at, one of the main ones is is lock it or lose it. Uh, that has been a staple since I've been in the, the crime prevention unit. And uh, we, we go door to door, we do uh, door, -to -door, door to door canvassing where we, we'll deliver flyers, uh, reminding people to lock up their car doors and remove valuables from the cars. Uh, we'll go to malls and we'll stand outside and deliver flyers to uh, customers of the mall as they're leaving, uh, just reminding people to make sure they take their valuables out of the car. Uh, that that uh, is one of the main things. Neighborhood Watch is another program that I oversee, and uh, we're we're trying to kind of get that back up and running. It uh, seems to have, have dipped off over the years, and and um, I know uh, OPP they are looking at a revamp of the whole program and renaming it and taking away the name Neighborhood Watch. Um, we're just waiting for an update on that. Um, Another another uh, part of the, the proactive policing is getting out and doing presentations. So uh, one of the things that I do is quite a few presentations. It'll be on personal safety. Uh, it'll be workplace safety. It'll be uh, 
uh, frauds, home security, and uh, it'll be to community members, it'll be to some of the active neighborhood watch groups that are that are up and running in, in the region, and, uh, and a lot of workplace will go in and I'll, I'll talk to employees. Uh, they could be government employees, they could be uh, private run companies, and we'll go in and I'll, I'll do uh, workplace safety presentations. Uh, crime prevention through environmental design, uh, the acronym we co is called SEPTED. So it's a specialized training where uh, you look at a design of, of a building, uh, an area, a neighborhood, uh, it could be any one of those things, and how that influences crime trends. And from a policing perspective, from a, a crime prevention perspective, we will approach the building with the person who, with the owner or the, the occupant, and discuss strategies to make their, their property more secure. Often it is done um, as a proactive measure. There are times when we're doing it as a reactive measure. If there's been a break in into a business or into a, a, a residence, we'll go and meet with the owner and, and help them implement ideas of, of how to make their home or business more secure and less likely to be a target of, of a break in or a mischief, and whichever crime it's, we're concerned about at the time. Um, another part of my duties is, uh, is I, I do liaise with the crime analyst. I'll, I'll meet with the, uh, the one district command team um, for their weekly meetings. And if there's any information that pertains to uh, a current crime trend that's ongoing within the, within the district, uh, we'll come up with, with a strategy to, uh, to deal with that, uh, with that issue that, that's happening at the time. Uh, I'm, the Central Ontario Crime Prevention Association, that is an organization that is uh, multi-jurisdictional. So it's, it's throughout the province and we'll, we'll have officers uh, from mostly from the GTA and, and we'll get together several times a year and we'll discuss uh, the latest trends in crime prevention and uh, a, lot of, a lot of issues that have, that have come up and how officers have addressed them uh, and new, new strategies. And that, uh, that is pretty much it, subject to any questions. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, Stella. So I th each Monday, I sit down with my command team. And in that room, I would have Della, Rich, uh, both my detective sergeants from CIB, and my sergeant for Corps, and the staff sergeant for uniform of that day. And each Monday, we go through a lot of the crime trends that Della is speaking of, what happened on the weekend, what's happened since Monday. And we look at those trends, and that's how we decide how we may deploy our officers and what initiatives that are coming forward that we wish to approve. Uh, the complaint areas are generated so we can actually track and make sure that officers are responding to those areas. Um, but we try to take a holistic approach. We may have a uh, CIB uh, break and enter initiative where we're looking at certain targets. Along with that, we would have Rich do uh, crime prevention in that specific neighborhood. And we would add that uh, information to what we call our sector hit list, which identifies for those officers, say in one in uh, 14th sector, which is East Willembury, where we want to see those priority patrols. And when we speak of that directed patrol car, that's exactly what that is. That's an opportunity for me to direct patrols to a specific area to, to uh, deal with specific issues. It's our really our goal is to tailor made the type of policing for those different communities because East Gwillimbury is different from King, which is different from Newmarket, which is different from Aurora, and the trends are very different in the types of break and enters and who's committing those break and enters and the types of, uh, whether it could be graffiti, it could be graffiti because it's um, simply a tag or turf uh, graffiti, or it could be um, hate crime related graffiti. So we tr we, it's important that we actually tailor our response to that. So. And reporting to us is really the key. Um, we can't do this analysis without uh, real valid information. And that comes down to the reporting piece. And we really encourage people to use the tools we have uh, through our website, whether it's our road watch program to identify uh, driving issues, uh, through Crime Stoppers if people wish to remain anonymous, or just utilizing either a phone call or an email to us to identify a complaint you may have. Um, Della mentioned, and it's very accurate, that uh, East Gwilinbury is one of our safest communities, 
But I know as a homeowner as well, when you come out in the morning and there's damage done to your car or uh, the Christmas lights are stolen, as much as that might not be a serious crime, it's important to you if you're that homeowner. And it really does affect uh, that quality of life. So we take all of those issues uh, very, very seriously. I also wanted to talk a little bit about that communication piece, and it's really important, uh, and, we, and we continue to advertise our ability that we communicate and people can follow us. Uh, we are one of the leaders in uh, Twitter with uh, 125,000 followers. Uh, we have our Instagram uh, accounts. We have our YouTube accounts. Uh, our corporate communications does a fantastic job. These people, young people in there, uh, have a great way of looking at things uh, recently. And you can go and look at our uh, Keep Your Head Up campaign where we make the analogy to hockey. And now we have these hockey pucks that we give out uh, that say, keep your head up, don't text and drive all of those things that are done uh, I encourage you I encourage the community to really take the opportunity to see uh, and take a look at those uh, those tools we have to get to know us and get to know what we're doing in your community for sure so thank you on behalf of both of us and we have questions and we can all three of us field questions it's uh, go ahead Thank you very much. Wonderful to have you here, and, and uh, I'll take questions first from members of council. But we do have some people in the audience and sorry, staff, and, and staff as well, and uh, we we will ask as well from them. Councillor Persicini. First of all, for a great presentation, um, I have a few questions, and I'm glad we're safe. By the way, and he's going very. The first one is uh, you said you're going to have a. A new station, whereabouts? So the new station will be located on Harry Walker Parkway in Newmarket, okay. almost down to Mulock. So I thought it was up talk on Young Street, but I guess it's been moved on. Yeah, so it's Harry Walker next to where the new EMS facility is going in there. Okay, and the next question is uh, um, mental health. How much training or what's involved in uh, some of the training for the officers and what happens, what's the protocol when you go to questions and one? When you go on uh, someone, you have a call and someone has, you're not sure if he has mental health or not. How do you kind of uh, well, deal with the situation? Mental health is now, I think, something that's ingrained uh, into our training right from the very beginning. Um, mental health training starts at that recruit level, starts right at uh, the Ontario Police College, and it starts within our own uh, training facility. Uh, a lot of times our interactions with people are when they are in crisis. Many people live with mental health issues and they live very uh, productive lives, but sometimes uh, they become in crisis. And that's often when the police are called uh, to an, an, an event where a family member is concerned about a loved one. Uh, that loved one might be uh, looking at harming themselves or taking their own life or uh, due to some sort of uh, mental health or psychotic episode, they might be uh, looking to harm someone else as well. So it's uh, uh, first and foremost when we arrive on scene uh, for those types of calls, the, the way we progress through that is, the, is ensuring uh, public safety for those and those uh, persons around. Uh, and our, uh, our mind, our primary objective is to de-escalate that and hopefully uh, through uh, an apprehension get that person uh, to a place of safety. Uh, through the Mental Health uh, Act, we would apprehend that person and take them to a hospital and take it from there. What we've implemented though uh, over the years, which has really improved us, is, is our work with mental health support workers. Having them come in right during that a period of time where that person is in crisis, when the when the uh, event is then deemed safe, and making sure that we steer that person in the right direction to get mental health support, and then the follow up piece afterwards. In years past, we would have responded to something like that. Uh, we would have taken to the hospital. The doctor would agree to admit that person, and we would be done with it. And it's important now through our our partnerships with mental health support that there's that follow up with that individual. Uh, when they go home uh, to make sure that they're continuing to get the mental health support through their physician or through another profession uh, for them. It's come a long way and I'm so glad that this has happened to me because it's, uh, it must be the most uh, complicated situation when you do have a call like that. 
uh, and how to, you know, de escalate the, the whole situation and, and make sure that someone, everyone is safe. And uh, I think we have come a long way, and I'm very, very proud that this more education is, is happening and uh, continue on the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, other than having um, the the receiving the type of complaints that you could typically think of when someone has a crime that they're reporting, what kind of reporting is helpful to you? The kind that perhaps doesn't depict a crime happening, but it predicts or um, um, it might be a traffic situation or tie-ups or hold-ups, uh, lesser things, not priority one, but priority two or three. What kind of things are helpful to you that you do want to hear about? And, and which method, you, you list your methods mm -hmm. there, but which method is the most, um, the best for you? Well, traffic management being uh, one important issue, and that's where we are building, I believe, building better partnerships with the region, but also better partnerships with uh, the town as well. Um, generally, when people phone in about a uh, traffic management issue, um, it impacts uh, uh, policing, but it also impacts uh, the town in the way we look at even road design. Um, and engineering. Uh, we can look at, sometimes we'll have a complaint about a stop sign, for instance, um, but there might be an issue where trees need to be cut back because the stop sign isn't uh, visible. Mm -hmm. So those types of complaints are, are very important and uh, it's my goal to build a better relationship as well with the town so we have those mutual conversations of how we can work together to deal with mm -hmm. a, uh, a traffic complaint like that. Um, I think it's very important uh, through uh, through communication, either through email or uh, through phone calls, that people bring the concerns of their community forward. So, and if they're concerned about cars that are, or cars, or ATVs, or dirt bikes that are ripping up and down their street, often they wait until they've hmm. had it up to here. And that's when we get the call. And I believe it's really important that we get that call earlier on when that trend is emerging, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Madam Mayor, to continue is that people feel, well, the police are busy and I really don't want to bother them. This is not an emergency and it's not a priority one or even a two. But um, uh, you do want to hear from people when they're t t um, seeing a trend or something changing or something different in their community. Absolutely, and, and yeah. uh, to get away from traffic, uh, just the fact when you come out in the morning and someone's rifled through your car because you mistakenly left it unlocked. And there might be... Uh, I was going to say CDs, but I don't think anybody has CDs in their car anymore. But um, you may have some change that was in your car that's gone, uh, maybe a jacket or something that really doesn't mean a lot to you. And people don't um, report those because they, same as you just said, it's not important. I know the police are very busy. Um, but those are the tools that, that uh, we use, and that's the information that Della needs in order to identify that, okay, we're starting to see a problem of people going through cars, and suddenly something more valuable is taken. And then we see a lot more cameras as well uh, being installed in people's homes where they can capture that image of that person going through the car, and maybe they only took the change out of your uh, out of your coffee holder, but down the street they took someone's laptop and it's a bit more uh, serious. So mm -hmm. we do have online reporting tools for that as well. So you can go on and enter all of the information online on our website and hit enter and it's uh, it then progresses through our process. And generally in those you'll get a call back either from one of our uh, cadets or somebody in our detective office just to see if you've had any more information. And if you don't, um, that might not be an offense that we can start an investigation right away, but certainly we can add that to our um, analysis so we can see the trend emerge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, one more item, Madam Mayor. Um, I appreciate your uh, programs, um, wear your seatbelt or your uh, projects that you specifically mm -hmm. spend time um, promoting. And um, the distracted driving one is a very important one to me. And anytime I see something you have posted, I try to repost it uh, through my ways, um, my uh, online uh, methods, so that mm -hmm. other people know that that's something that's really important. It's extremely disturbing, and I think a lot of accidents now mm -hmm. ha must be tracing back to distracted driving of one Absolutely. sort or another. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be too big of a heading, but there's a lot that is uh, tracing, I think, tracing back to texting. 
Absolutely. And it's disturbing to see that. Yeah. And by you forwarding those messages that we put out, that's all part of that education piece, which mm -hmm. is really going to be uh, the method of solving the issue. It'll be through education, uh, more so than enforcement. Okay, thank you. Councillor Roy Di Clemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you to, uh, to Superintendent Slack, thank you very much for, uh, for all of this information. Um, it's really helpful. Uh, I had two two subjects I wanted to touch on. One was um, your the resources that are allocated to patrol districts. As you mentioned at the top of your presentation, we have uh, we are a really quickly growing community. Uh, right now, there are two cars assigned to to EG. Uh, we've issued over a thousand occupancy permits, and mm -hmm. our population is climbing quickly. And uh, and obviously, our square kilometers are quite large as well. Do you have an understanding, or is there a threshold of a volume of calls? or um, number of, of incidents or so on where you would be able to increase the number of resources allocated to our community? Absolutely. So you see that evidence-based decision-making and that business intelligence. And, and now that we've actually placed a threshold of that 30%, 30%, uh, 30 and 10, um, when that uh, generated calls for service starts to exceed that 30%, as we see it's up to 40, and that's where we now start to, we need to look at adding an additional uh, patrol to that area. Uh, one uh, additional patrol is around a million dollars. Um, so it, it's a very important that we base that on that, that uh, evidence-based decision making. I think people should know as well that um, the way the patrol zones work in those priority calls is um, the one and two calls we dispatch out of sector, which means if there's a priority one or two call in East Gwillimberry, cars will be pulled out of new market to respond to that call. You're not waiting. It's the priority three calls where you can remain and they will remain in your sector. Um, but I'm also concerned about um, that length of time, that response time and that call for service. Um, as much as it might be a priority three call, um, people should not have to wait excessive amounts of time before an officer arrives uh, to take their report. So you're at 40% now. At what point do, do you go to the police services board and say, I need a million bucks for another car in EG? Well, our budget was just uh, done, and uh, but absolutely. We've been doing uh, population trends. Uh, short answer, I don't have that threshold number for you, um, but I know there is uh, long-term plans to increase the policing, hence the the newer uh, building as we're even if I uh, we were approved from our officers I do not have another single locker in our uh, current facility we're ready to move to a new facility for sure <laughs> thank you uh, and through you madam mayor the the other item I wanted to talk about was um, uh, I get a fair amount of outreach and I'm sure all of us do um, from residents regarding commercial vehicular traffic mm -hmm. and I and I know that YRP's uh, commercial motor vehicle inspection team is mm -hmm. one of the best in the province. We've I've seen that and heard about that. Um, but what residents are looking for is is an understanding or maybe a little bit of information about what's happening on the roads. Um, yesterday, obviously, your presentation is timely, but yesterday there was a, a rather dramatic uh, mm -hmm. collision between three three commercial right. vehicles uh, in our community. But but other truck haul routes as well around uh, our our commercial fill sites along Ravenshoe and along those sort of large haul corridors where people are worried about. Um, speeding trucks, overloaded trucks, unsafe trucks. Can you right. tell us a little bit more about the initiatives that YRP is doing to address right. that? So you mentioned our commercial motor vehicle investigative team, but we also have a number of our officers uh, on those platoons who are also uh, trained in commercial motor vehicle inspection. And this, uh, thus far this year, we've ran uh, three initiatives uh, specific to commercial motor vehicles where our officers are pulling those vehicles over and doing those inspections. As well, um, we have another one coming up uh, uh, in December is, is starting as well, where our officers will team up with either the core unit or the commercial motor vehicle inspection unit to do specific uh, commercial motor vehicle inspections. And whether it's uh, tow trucks or uh, dump trucks, uh, and look at those uh, issues. Um, also, when we look at East Gwillimberry and you look at the traffic patterns, you have a lot of uh, roads where, where people are literally driving through East Gwillimberry. They're not, they're not stopping. Uh, and those are the roads you'll see. And some people will often ask, well, why are the officers sitting, whether it's Queensville Side Road or on Second Concession, uh, rather than on my 
uh, smaller street on the side where I see a lot of problems. And the reason we do that is those are the routes where people are traveling through uh, East Gwillimbury during especially high commuting times. But that's also the areas where we're looking for those uh, commercial motor vehicles that are potentially overloaded or uh, speeding. And there's nothing worse than a speeding overloaded uh, truck. And when we see these collisions, as we saw uh, yesterday, of course, there's a thorough investigation which will determine what really was the cause. Um, and from that, that's how we look at uh, whether it's a high collision intersection as well and look at the commercial motor vehicle piece. Uh, just further, I, I guess uh, it, it may also be a question of perception from residents where um, a, a large dump truck that's loaded may be traveling at the speed, at the speed limit, but mm -hmm. they may not be. And as a, as right. to the untrained eye, it feels like that truck is speeding even when it may or may not be. If even if there may even have equipment on there to limit their speed. But is there, uh, is there some sort of a, a crime map or what have you that we can point residents to to say, uh, you know, we've we've had we've investigated this many or these locations mm -hmm. to say, you know what, the trucks that are coming and going from this site uh, have are checked on a regular basis, and we've done some enforcement and we've found no problems. Right. Um, or 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 is it that you know, or maybe it's Ravenshoe where the trucks are traveling, and and quite frankly, in our community, we've got a lot of construction vehicles uh, that are coming here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and may or may not be following the rules of the road so is there some data that we can share with residents well on our website you will see uh in our business plan and everything is on our website that does speak specifically to our enforcement priorities uh, also on that website there's a link to our crime management map where you can actually uh, look at the types of incidents that we are responding to and you'll see uh, included in that, um, I believe, is collisions, but I'd have to uh, verify that as well. And that's something that you can get regular updates. So a person who lives um, along that route can actually see reg get regular updates emailed to their smartphone where they can actually see um, the, the latest crimes or the latest incidents that are occurring in their neighborhood. And I would have to just verify whether traffic would be part of that, but I believe all the different types of calls are listed there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had a couple of, of items I wanted to talk about. One earlier, you had, had spoken about a neighborhood watch. And I know that uh, we all hear from people saying, what can we do? And I'm wondering if you could just outline, um, I know that, that it has kind of uh, waned off a little bit and, and we're looking at to bring it back. I'm wondering what can people do to uh, work in their community with their neighbors to, okay. to make it safer? I'm gonna turn that over to Rich, but before I'll make one uh, comment. And what we've found is with the Neighborhood Watch, it's really people driven. And you often get that one person in the neighborhood who is a real spitfire and really engaged and really involved, but is also able to bring those groups together, whether they're uh, through their own Facebook pages that they create for that community. Um, you really need, and that's what uh, I've kind of challenged Rich with doing, is revitalizing some of our current neighborhood watch um, and when we are setting up a new neighborhood watch to identify that person that's that person that really brings that, uh, that street together in that respect. Uh, as well, what we want to do once we identify those people is we're going to identify them for our sector officers. So an officer uh, that's patrolling that area will know exactly who the neighborhood watch coordinator uh, would be. And if they happen to see them out on their uh, mowing the grass or whatever, we encourage them to pull over, have a conversation, and have that face-to-face -face and get to know one another as well. But I'll turn that over to Rich. Thank you. Yeah, the superintendent covered a lot of that, uh, of what, it, what I would, would have mentioned. Uh, but with Neighborhood Watch, uh, where, it's, where it's at now is, is um, oftentimes we'll get a request and it'll come, come through, uh, filter down, it'll come in through YRP.ca and it gets filtered down to the respective crime prevention officer. We will do a follow-up with, uh, with the citizen and, and inquire as to uh, getting the Neighborhood Watch up and running and we'll forward them some documents that uh, encompass how to start a neighborhood watch, uh, about going out and canvassing, and, and how York Regional Police will be a liaison with the lead of a neighborhood watch. So oftentimes uh, wh what happens is uh, we get, uh, we get, we get the, the citizen request, and then there's not that initial 
um, response to go ahead with neighborhood watch and and I think the, the average person may think of it as being because we're all we're all so busy uh, as a bit of uh, uh, an imposing uh, a structure to go after because lives are busy uh, there's work the, the communities are are changing as well now where uh, a lot of a lot of bedroom communities and and uh, where they are commuting and uh, they don't want to get to know their neighbors so when we do get one that's up and running and and there are a handful that are that are uh, active and and functioning and um, I've got a couple that I'm sort of Kind of massaging through and hoping to get them up and running. Uh, down in down in King City, we had an, some incidents of, of vandalism that, that were taking place, and I met with the homeowners and and uh, we did some security assessments of their homes. and And during the course of that, we started discussing neighborhood watch. So uh, the, the the complainant of, of in the in the vandalism incidents, uh, he went forward into the community and he started canvassing people. I explained to him how how to get out there and and start getting this done and. And, and then he was able to recruit quite a few people. And he's re reached out to me, and now we're going to go from there. So once we do get an, a number of interested people, I will meet with the community members. And, and it could be at a, at a community center. Uh, I've met them at one district. We have a community room that's, that's open, and I just booked the, booked the evening, and people will come out. And I, uh, I do a presentation about, about what Neighborhood Watch is and how it got started, and, um, and then a, a home security presentation. And, and then we'll just kind of talk about uh, uh, any concerns about how to get it up and running and, and continuing. And I'll just mention one other thing is that uh, with the established neighborhood watch groups, the technology is amazing now. So a lot of the times, uh, I'll, I'll, there's one, one example of a neighborhood watch group down at uh, St. John's in, in Aurora. Um, they have a WhatsApp, on, and it, everybody's connected through their smartphones. So uh, it's, a smaller, it's a smaller community, so we're able to kind of organize it relatively easy. Um, so if somebody that appears suspicious or is unknown to any, any of the community members, they will actually send out uh, a text message on WhatsApp and reach out to uh, the other members of the community. So let's say it's a van that drives, drives through and it's stopped out front of a home. Somebody will, will ask, does anybody know who this van is for? And if nobody answers, the, the citizen, they've actually, because we met on, on Thursday night, we had a, a safety presentation. Uh, they said, yeah, we, we get out and we actually go up and just ask people. Hey, are you, see, are you lost? Do you need any help? Anything like that. So they're pretty proactive as well, which is great. Um, so, and then if there is a suspicious vehicle or, or a van that doesn't look like it, like it fits in within the community for whatever reason, uh, they will fire off that message to, to their, uh, fellow neighborhood watch members and and uh yeah it might be it might be uh, the landscaping company and, and someone will respond yeah that person's for me so that's kind of where it's at now um, the technology is amazing and, and facebook whatsapp those kind of things are, are what's driving the neighborhood watch groups that are that are in uh in progress now that are, that are functioning it's, it seems that there needs to be an incident to get people um, um, it, engaged. With, it appears with, to be that way, yes. Um, and, yeah. th and that's unfortunate. Uh, we know that more eyes and ears in the community makes a safer community. So uh, I just Absolutely. offer up that should there be anyone um, in touch as far as East Gwillimbury, that we do have facilities for meetings as well, and, and uh, yeah. they would be available. Um, and and um, we'll try and, and encourage people to to talk to their neighbors and and even if it's not a formal neighborhood watch um, maybe more informal but uh, it it uh, it really does make a safer community we know that absolutely and it helps us because the more people we have the more eyes and ears out there uh, who are able to to see anything that's out of the ordinary <laughs> that they can call us and we can respond it's fantastic to have that. So. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank I have you. a question for um, for the superintendent as well, uh, and it, it's regarding our ride program. And uh, we all see the statistics every week that YRP puts out about the number of impaired drivers that that are stopped and, and charged. And uh, I know at one time there was a ride program, particularly in the Christmas season. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can just talk a little bit about what we're doing to continue to get uh, impaired drivers off the road. Right. So the ride program uh, still exists. Uh, the ride program, as you see it in the larger scale with our 
our ride truck where usually when you go through those programs it, they're quite uh, large um, that ride program uh, still exists and is managed through our uh, traffic uh, management uh, unit um, but right now in one district we also have an initiative that's all four platoons wide um, where we do a uh, strategic ride that is the priority right now for the month of December is uh, is ride and what I would say is strategic ride we uh, collect information we collect data on our last drink program where we, we look to identify uh, with our impaired drivers uh, or collisions where there's been uh, uh, suspicion of impairment uh, and we look to where they would have had their last drink and we look for those types of patterns as well and that's how we strategically now are more strategic in where we place our ride programs as not just a uh, as an enforcement tool but also a prevention so people know um, and that's the real goal here is is the prevention piece not necessarily the catching piece although that's a that's a tool as well so thank you very much um, I did notice that someone's put uh, our crime reports map up on the screen. Uh, so this is the crime reports map uh, that's available to everyone through our website. Uh, and it does have the ability to get uh, links and notifications as well. And it's a very valuable tool as, as uh, some of you said, sometimes we get uh, oh, there's been robberies in my neighborhood. Well, a robbery for me is a crime against a violence against a person where they've taken something from that person. When the reality is it's uh, break-ins to vehicles, which are, again, we've talked about, so serious. But uh, I don't know if, Rich, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, crime reports map? Because that's part of your, uh, I think, presentation as well. Yeah, so the, the, the crime reports map, uh, essentially, it's just an, an effective tool that anybody can have access to. Uh, you, just, you just need to access uh, yrp.ca, and uh, once you're in there on the, on the very front page, you'll see uh, the crime map uh, option, and you click on it. There's a disclaimer, and, and uh, if you accept the terms and conditions, and then you just access uh, into uh, into the crime map, and you can break it down into the uh, respective area in which in which you live. Um, and uh, you can break it down into the type of crime, the type of incident that you're looking for. And uh, as, as you find the area in which you live, if there's something that, that uh, piques your interest and there's, there's uh, uh, one of our icons there, you can, you can scroll down onto it. Essentially, it gives you a, a general location of where the incident took place. It won't be a, an exact address. And it'll give you, uh, it'll, it'll show an occurrence number and uh, which uh, it'll tell you what, what type of incident it was. Maybe it was an assault, maybe it was a theft from vehicle, maybe it was a theft of vehicle. And that's essentially it. And, and, uh, and you, can, you can backdate uh, going up to a year, uh, six months, uh, a week, a day. And it gives you all, all kinds of different options. So a very effective tool to help uh, anybody find out what's going on within, within their community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any members of uh, our audience that would like to ask any questions at this time? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not seeing any. Okay. Uh, I, I want to thank you very much for for coming out. We have a very strong partnership with YRP, and uh, and a presentation like this it makes us realize how fortunate we are to be a part of a, a wonderful organization that uh, is out there looking after us on a, on a regular basis. And, and while um, we can't prevent every crime and every accident, we, we know that we are in a safe community and it's because of the training of your officers. So we thank you very, very much for that. Well, thank you, Mayor. It's a pleasure to come. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we are a regional police uh, service, but we are your police service uh, uh, through and through here at One District. So we thank you very much. Thank you, and, and we have taped this today, and it will go on our, our website, uh, and I hope that we have a lot of people who, who take the time to have a look at it. There's a lot of valuable information today that we'll be able to share with our entire community, so thank you very much. Thank you. I will move